Hello and welcome to I'll Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Maury of Drea Renee Knits and this is where I try to answer some of your questions that you have so generously asked and yeah just getting back into the swing of things. This past weekend was Rhinebeck and we also went to Wolm Folk and it was just I can't even my mind still hasn't caught up with it all so it was really amazing to meet so many incredible knitters and to see all the sweaters and shawls and everything everyone was wearing. Um, I brought my husband which some of you know as Spicy Pete uh, and that was just so fun to be able to kind of experience a fiber festival through his eyes and somebody who's never been to one before. Um, and we met just an incredible amount of amazing knitters. So thank you so much to everyone who said hi. And I can't believe I think this was our best year yet with the knit along and our meetup on the hill. I got to meet so many of you and check out your amazing sweaters in person. And we got a pretty good group photo. I'm going to be sharing that in my newsletter. Um, so if you're not signed up, you should be. There's a link below in the show notes. And it was just incredible. I, I really, my mind is still trying to play catch up with the whole experience. So um, just a really fantastic weekend. We did have to come home early. We ended up hitting the road on Sunday morning because we had a little kiddo who wasn't feeling good. So we wanted to hurry up and get home to him to make sure he was okay, which he is. He's great now. I uh, just needed just needed those mama cuddles and he was right as rain. So we have some great questions here. Today I'm wearing my Rose Cardi, which I had not worn in a little while. And I put it on and was like, man, why am I not wearing this thing like every day? So this is actually one of the designs I am most proud of. It is a very unique I think construction with a lot going on because there is cables there's different rates of shaping going on um, above and below and there's fading it's worked side to side and then seamed um, there's like a seam up the back and yeah I just proud of this one <laughs> so it feels really nice to be wearing it today and we are just full swing beautiful fall weather here. It is like glowing yellow orange leaves outside of my window in a brisk 45 degrees. So pretty lovely day here. But what else? I'm going to, I'm actually going to do a little show and tell right out the gate here and then we'll jump into the questions. Just because I have it sitting here and I'm excited and I'd like to show you. By the way, I what really surprised me most over the weekend was how many people came up who watched this. And that just tickled me to no end because, you know, it's kind of funny to do something like this. You're sitting alone in a room chatting to a phone and I don't ever get to see the other side. I don't know. You know, I'm like, I hope somebody <laughs> enjoys this or watches it or gets something out of it. So to have so many of you come up to me and say that you enjoy it was just made my whole weekend. So, so fun. Um, all right. So this was actually my travel project. This is some of my hand spun. This is Nest Fiber. It was a club colorway that I absolutely loved. Like it's just very unexpected. It has this lavender and then almost this kind of poppy orange and then even like a little teensy bit of like ochre slash kind of grungy green. And I just love it. <laughs> so I had finished up three patterns the week before Rhinebeck weekend. And I was like, I do not have the bandwidth to start a new design um, and to travel with that during the chaos of the festival weekend. So I was like, I just need like a grab and go kind of project. So I was like, okay, I'm going to grab a precious skein of hand spun. I really haven't had hand spun on my needles in a while. So I wanted to do that. Um, so I grabbed this and hand wound it. And then I cast on a Harlow hat and I'm just doing it in one color instead of two color. So if you ever wanted to do a one color Harlow hat, you just use that one color throughout all of the directions. So you're going to use it both on your um, even rows and your odd rows. 
and I just did a one color tubular cast on instead of a two color and it has been so delightful it is so squishy it is heavier than a fingering weight this is actually like probably a DK um so I'm kind of playing around with I think I cast on 96 stitches I kind of chose a size in between Harlow the original and Harlow worsted and I was like mm, I'm just gonna go with that one and hope for the best uh, and I think I'm gonna knit it longer for maybe a folded brim the only thing is because it is so plumpy I've got a little noggin and it might make my head just look even smaller to have like a really big hat um, once it's folded <laughs> we'll see but that's just been a delightful kind of fill me up project I also hadn't had any brioche on my needles in a while so that's been really fun and then the other thing I brought for the weekend was my spinning so I grabbed my electric wheel and I've just really been wanting to spin lately but work's been so busy I haven't had a ton of time so I was like you know what I am gonna bring my spinning I just realized I must have twisted this while it was still a teensy bit damp but this is the latest um club colorway from hello yarn it is called Thorn Apple and it is Coriadale. And you can't see, it's a little dark in here. I'm doing this a lot earlier than I usually do it. So the sun is not fully up, but you can kind of see it's lots of kind of darker, moodier jewel tones. And I spun a standard three ply with a short forward draft. I actually messed up. So I had divided the braid into six strips vertically. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to do two strips per bobbin. I weighed them out so that they were pretty much equal per bobbin. And on one of my bobbin, bobbins, I spun from the other end. So I did that one backwards, which people do on purpose. So I was like, I'm just going to go with it. Um, so it'll be fun to see how this knits up because I totally was like, oops, <laughs> definitely did that one in the other direction from the other two. Um, but I love like the blue and there's some beautiful kind of plummy purple in here, a touch of almost like pale pink and gold. So my plan is just to knit up some socks. I wanted another pair of DRK Everyday socks. I have, I actually just wore through the heel in my very first pair out of my hand spun, which was a impulse cast on it was just a two ply I definitely was not spinning with socks in mind I was just spinning to spin and then decided to knit socks and I mean they've held up for a couple years of hard wear and the other day I was wearing them and at the end of the day I took them off I was like oops there's a hole so I do have some of that yarn left over so I'm going to try and mend those but in the meantime I wanted to try I thought this Corydale would be nice because Corydale has a nice long staple length so I felt like there would be some strength in there but let's get to some questions because I know some of you non-spinners are like get to the good stuff <laughs> uh but oh I like how that light you can kind of see this now na, 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 na. so this will be another good walking and knitting cast on for me um, once I get through the other project I'm working on right now, which is pretty much done. All right. So let's set that aside. And that was it for my show and tell. So let's answer some questions. Hello from Australia. Hello. I love watching your videos on Saturday mornings when I have a lion and husband entertains the kids. I always knit along whilst you chat and answer questions. Such a lovely ritual. That sounds so lovely. I love this idea. Um, I think that we should all, all get that treatment. That sounds delightful. I'm just finishing up your baubles pattern, but gearing up to do the last section of the pattern, the trickiest brioche I'll have ever knitted. I keep putting it off because I'm scared. It's so beautiful, by the way. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. Question one is lifelines. I use a lifeline in the lace so when I slip up and lose concentration, I can pull back to the knit or purl row. But for the tricky brioche bit, where do you recommend placing a lifeline? So such a great question. So I generally recommend 
putting the lifeline before you do anything that really scares you. So in brioche, a lot of times that's the shaping. Uh, more so the decreases than the increases. Increases are pretty easy to tink back. Um, decreases can feel a little more intimidating. I will say in, I think all of my video tutorials for brioche, when I show increasing and decreasing, I do show how to undo them as well. So make sure to check those out if you do need help going either direction as you're knitting up or if you have to take them out. Now, um, I was just thinking, I did do a special brioche bobble video. I don't know if I, for that shawl, um, cause you have to do like this increase and a bobble at the same time. And I don't know that I did show it how to undo there, but you can go reference my other, um, like bark four stitch increase or decrease videos. And I show how to back out, but I, so I would do it before you do like a big increase or decrease row and for bobbles that is more twisty turny at the end of that shawl. So if it's kind of a lot of shaping happening consistently, then I might just decide, okay, I am, I always say, how much are you willing to remit? <laughs> so once you're to the end of a shawl and it's quite a few stitches, um, you might only be willing to remit a few rows. So you might want to keep moving that lifeline up every four rows or something and just keep doing that. You just wanna mark in your pattern or write yourself a little note so you know exactly where you did place the lifeline. So if you do have to tear down to it, you know where in the pattern you've just gone back to. Um, and I love lifelines in brioche because I think that especially if you are at all newer to brioche or even just if you haven't had to tear back in brioche a lot and get it back on your needle, the trickiest bit is all those little yarn over shawls and figure out where they go, especially if you do have increasing and decreasing happening. Um, it's just a lot easier if you have a line to follow so you know that you're getting your needle in there exactly as it's meant to be. So that's where I would do it. Either how far are you willing to re-knit, place it that many rows, or before you do the scary stuff. Okay, and I just want to reiterate, uh, for any of you who have not heard my lifeline spiel, I do it in every single class I teach. I've done it on here a few times. I'm not going to do the whole thing right now, but I just want to touch on the other reason why I love a lifeline. The great thing about lifelines is it gives you the opportunity to try to fix your mistakes without fear, because if you mess up, it doesn't matter because you can just tear down to the lifeline. So you can kind of pop things off your needles and try to fix it because that's the only way to really learn how to fix those mistakes, I feel. That is how I've gotten really good at fixing brioche mistakes and things like that. It's because I've had to do it. So practicing fixing our mistakes is how we learn to do it and to feel confident in it and to not get stressed out when we make a mistake because we know what to do. And having a lifeline in there, it's like having a net. You know, if you completely muck it up, it's fine. Cause you'll just go right down to that lifeline, tear everything out, put that needle back in, and you've only lost a little bit of time. So highly recommend lifelines. All right, so next question that she has is for the Winter's Beach Cardi. Uh, for the next pattern, I'll be, where did I lose my spot? Oh, for the next pattern, I'll begin. I've just realized it has no buttons. I think you've mentioned before, but could you give me an indication of the best method of doing a buttonhole band for this Cardi? If you're going to do buttons on this particular pattern of yours, which method would you use? I was planning to do just one button, I think, in the middle. Anyways, it would be absolute delight to hear my question. Yay! <laughs> so, you have a few options here. I wouldn't add a button band. I would put it in the moss stitch kind of edging of that sweater that looks kind of like the button band. Um, you'll know when you look at the pattern, but that treatment right there, and you knit that at the same time as the rest of the sweater. So I would put it in there. If you want an actual buttonhole, just once you get to about where you think you'd like to have that button, I would decide by looking at the schematic and the sweater and everything first about where you think you might like that. Um, and I would just do a one row buttonhole, especially if you only want one button, that's gonna be your most ideal. And you'll just need to determine how many stitches to do for your one row buttonhole based on how big you want, how big of a button you want. If you're only doing one button, you might want a fairly large button. 
Um, the other idea I wanted to suggest is what I am doing right now. And actually, it's kind of funny how I'm doing this right now. This isn't ideally how I would do this, but um, I was being lazy this morning. <laughs> so this is the rose cardigan, as I mentioned earlier, and it has no buttons. You can just wear it open. It's kind of funny that you can't see my head while I'm talking. But the way I like to do it is I actually just slip a cable needle in. Now, I do not, this morning I was too lazy to find the cable needle. I have a really pretty like little wooden cable needle that's like three inches long that I like to use. This morning I could not find it. So what I'm actually using is a wooden pin that you can use. This is nice for when you're pinning your knitwear to seam. <laughs> so I am just using one of those stuck in to hold it closed. Um, so easy peasy. And it actually does a really fantastic job. So that's an idea if you don't even want to fiddle with making a buttonhole and figuring all that out. And then my last idea for you is to just do either an I-cord or a crochet chain button loop that you could attach and then you could do a toggle or one big button on the other side and close it like that. So that would be another idea. So there you go. Best of luck and can't wait to hear what you choose to do. All right, question number two. I am curious about sock heel techniques and the advantages or disadvantages of different types. Last fall, I participated in the Curio Knit Along because I was interested in the afterthought heel. I had made several unsatisfactory attempts at different cuff down socks where I got lost while turning a traditional heel. I love the Curio socks and I've made two more pairs. Yay, that makes me so happy. I have now moved on to the DRK Everyday Socks and noticed that you are using a different heel technique. Why? I would love to hear your thoughts around how you choose a heel technique for a pattern. So, um, a lot of times for me, it's going to depend on the patterning that I'm choosing to do on that sock. And a lot of times it's also determined by if I'm doing it toe up or cuff down. Everyone has their preferences, and I think people are very opinionated about their socks, and we all have our favorites. So my favorite heel is a flegal heel, and generally I like to do socks toe up. Um, that's the DRK Everyday Socks, are toe up, and they use a flegal heel. Those are my, that's my go-to sock pattern. Um, but for something like the Sparky Socks or the Curio Socks, I did them cuffed down and I used an afterthought heel. Um, the really lovely thing about an afterthought heel and the benefit to them is that generally the place we first wear out our socks is the heel. And so if you fall into that category, like me, where you're going to wear out the heel first, an afterthought heel, you get to, you can just tear off that heel, just unravel it and knit a new one. And so that's going to add longevity to your socks. Um... The flegal heel I love because it you never have holes at the sides. That's it's kind of like the underarm situation. People tend to get little holes from working that heel gusset um, when they turn the heel. And the flegal heel does a really, really beautiful job of avoiding that because you don't work all the way into the corners when you turn your heel. Um, so I just love that heel. I also find that it fits me well. One thing that I have kind of heard other knitters chat about, um, I'm no sock expert. I'm going to throw that out there. I have never done the deep dive into socks. I generally was like, what will work best with what is interesting me, which is the pattern I'm going to put into these socks, um, where there's other people that are like really into sock construction. And I would someday, I always have these fantasies of taking like a month <laughs> to go sit in a cabin and like deep dive one specific thing, you know, like socks or traditional color work or, you know, like just the things that I would love to learn more about. Um, so I know that there are people who know a lot more about different heels and who they're going to work for. So some can depend on how deep you need that heel depth to be, if you have a high arch or if you're flat footed, all of those can play a role. So for me, I have never knit a heel flat that fit me comfortably. They, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong, but they have just never 
worked for me. And I think heel flap is what I see the most of out there. Um, so I do, I feel like I need to try again. I don't know if I was just doing something wonky, but they have never fit me properly. Um, but there's also great books out there. If you're really interested in there, there is like some, a whole, so many socks out there that like sock books out there that really kind of dive in deeper that you could read about. So, um, but yeah, Flegel and Afterthought are just two of my favorites. And to kind of sum up again, if I'm going toe up, I'm probably going to use a Flegel heel. And if I'm going top down, I'm probably going to use an Afterthought heel. Uh, but it also depends on the patterning and everything I'm using and how that heel is going to look. All right. I can't decide which of your big shawls to knit. I've only knit one skein shawl so far and don't find them very useful. I like ponchos, but want to try something different. I'd like a really cozy drapey shawl with good depth at the back. I've never tried half fisherman's rib or brioche, so I'm hesitant to try a pattern with these stitches in it. I need a pattern where row count isn't critical, i.e. I'll be able to increase the size necessary. I never seem to be able to match row gauge in a pattern. Which of your shawls do you recommend? So I liked this one. This one was kind of like a, a thinker. Uh, but I actually immediately thought of either my everyday shawl or my everyway shawl. I wish I had them right here to show you. I did not think I had there. And they are not hanging up on my shawl rack. Um, but I will link to them below. So the everyday and everyway shawls are rectangles. But the beauty of them is that they have buttons going across the bottom of one short edge and halfway up the side of one long edge. And so you can wear them in a ton of different ways, including a poncho. And they're pretty easy to increase the size of because you can knit them for longer to get a longer wrap out of them. Um, one is just, they're both end capped in designs. So the everyday shawl, I'm gonna mess up which one is which. I shouldn't have named them so similarly. But one has just knit pearl, a chevron design on each end, and then the middle is stockinette. And then the other one has color work um, at each end. And yeah, I think that those might be ideal for you. There's some interest in there, but also once you get into the body, they're just easy peasy knitting. And um, you can definitely wear them different ways and adjust the size if need be. So I will link those below for you. And let's see, next question. I am so confused about putting my spinning on a storage bobbin. So when I put it on a storage bobbin, am I ready to ply? Do I have to then put it I'm gonna read that differently. I didn't read that properly. I just went off on my own. <laughs> Rewind. Okay. <laughs> also, that's not the rewind sound effect. My husband would be able to do that so well. I don't know if you've ever tried to do sound effects with somebody in your life, but it can be really funny if one of you knows how to do sound effects and the other one doesn't. Um, I am not so great at sound effects, but I tend to use them to talk a lot to get my point across. Um, so anyways, I digress. Back to the question, starting over. I am so confused about putting my spinning on a storage bobbin. So when I put it on storage bobbins and I am ready to ply, do I have to then put it back on a different bobbin so that it is going the way I spun it in the first place? I swore you said we could put it on storage bobbins and then ply from those. However, some of the ladies in our spinning group think we would have to set it back the way we spun it. Please unconfuse me. Is that a word? Sure. I think it sounds like a great word. So I actually might have a storage bobbin here. I'm just going to see. Okay. Storage bobbin. And... Unfortunately, I do not have one with anything on it. So these are what I will rewind my singles onto. Yes, you can absolutely spin straight from the storage bobbin. And by spin, I mean ply. Um, that's, I would not move them onto a storage bobbin if I then had to move them back onto a different bobbin. The whole point, besides like if you need to clear up bobbins, 
so that you can use them to spin on too. The whole point in using a storage bobbin and re putting, rewinding your singles onto here is so that you are spinning in the same direction again. So when you are spinning, and let's say you're doing, generally you want to do this if you were doing um, worsted spinning, like a short forward draft. Um, so when we're doing that, we are smoothing the fiber as it's going onto our wheel, right? So if we don't rewind onto a storage bobbin or onto anything, onto another bobbin, whatever, um, once we go to ply them, you are now actually smoothing in the opposite direction. So we've done all that work to create this smooth, <laughs> this smooth yarn, but then we're plying and we're kind of roughing up in the opposite way. So when you put it back on here, you are now going back from where you started and you're re-smoothing. And I have found that it does make a difference. Now, am I gonna do it every single time? No life's just a little too short for me. I don't have enough free time to do that. Do I think it would be worth it? Maybe. I mean, I have really enjoyed how nice and smooth my worsted spun yarns are when I take the time to move my singles onto a new bobbin and then ply from there. Um, so hopefully I said that in a way that makes sense. Basically, by putting them onto a new bobbin, you are starting from that original same end again, and they're going in that direction so that you are keeping all that smoothing intact instead of roughing it up. Because if you go straight from the bobbin you spun onto, now you're going from the end of what you spun. So it's going in the opposite direction. So as you're plying, like I like to hold my usually kind of like this, or if it's a three ply. So as I'm plying, it's roughing it up a little bit um, because it's going in the opposite direction that I spun my single. So I hope that makes sense. So yes, spin straight from those storage bobbins. All right, last question. For two color, color work, I hold one color in each hand, which I learned from one of your weekly videos. Yay! <laughs> but there's been a few times where I have to have three colors going and I really struggle trying to figure out how to hold it all. I'm curious what you do. Do you hold two in one hand and one in the other? Or do you drop a strand and pick it back up when needed? Or something else? I just need to find a much better way of doing it. So I do generally then I'll hold two in one hand. If that feels like too much, I would drop one and I would I would still hold two, especially because a lot of times, obviously not every time, but when I have had to hold three strands, it's not super often, but I feel like there's one that you use the least. So that's the one that I would probably just drop or that I would hold with one of my other yarns. Um, but if it, if it does feel like too much to have two in one hand, um, I, I would just drop it and pick it up when you need it because I think that'll help it be a little more fluid and less confusing. You also might want to check out, they do, you can find these rings that you wear that have different loops. So when you're using multiple colors, it holds them apart for you. And then they would all be on one hand, but you could try something like that as well and see how that feels for you. And maybe for you i mean unfortunately this is one of those answers where i'm like you here's a whole lot of options and you have to figure out what just feels best for you you know what feels more intuitive for you because it might even be a case of when you're doing three colors you don't do the two-handed thing you keep them all in one and you pick them up as you need them you know whatever just feels more comfortable for you so that you don't feel like they're getting tangled and disorganized and that might be the round or two where you just have to slow down you have your three cakes right there and you just slowly go across watching your tension um and then on your two color rounds you just start grooving you know okay so i think that's it how are we doing oh that's a pretty good time about half hour so yeah, our Alpen Glow Knit Alongs done, which I can't believe. Um, it was so, so fantastic. Thank you again to everyone who said hi. And I will, one of these days, I'm going to have 
Peter come join me and kind of give us his thoughts on what he thought of the whole fiber festival. I wish we could have gone back on Sunday. Sunday tends to be the quieter day um, so that he could have really just like looked around because we were definitely just chatting with people and stuff the whole time. So um, if I can get him to come back with me another year, I'm, we'll come back on Sunday um, when it's a little bit slower so he can kind of see what that vibe is like. Um, I did finally start my weekender spin hopefully i gotta do some sampling i gotta see if it's right i don't know why i'm having such a hard time i have already in a couple hand spun sweaters and for some reason this one i'm like <laughs> having a hard time deciding so crossing my fingers i showed y'all the fiber i'm using so i already have one bobbin done with one of the colors so i'm hoping to do the other two colors and then i'm gonna apply a little bit of it up and see how i feel uh, but fingers crossed, I finally, finally got it how I want it. And so that is the knit along that is still going on right now is the DRK spin it to knit it knit along weekender style. And I think that's all the knit alongs going right now. But we have more coming. We have um, Candace from hopefully you cannot just hear that doodloot <laughs> maybe it was just in my ears I turn off my notifications there I'll turn off my iPad and then it can't notify me so Candace from the Farmer Starter Fibers was chatting about starting a big cozy cardi knit along kind of right towards mid to end of December um, once people are done with some of their holiday knitting and maybe get to get back to the selfish knitting. So keep an eye out for that. I'll definitely share it as um, I get more information from her on that. And then we also have the annual fall knit along challenge, which is a four day sock knit along challenge. The pattern is in testing right now and uses a brand new yarn that I think might be my favorite new sock yarn. I couldn't believe how strong it is and it is so soft. Um, just a really beautiful yarn. So I'm actually working on my second sample of that right now, uh, but that'll be coming up in the next couple weeks. And then we also have the annual Insta Friends Knit Along, which is hosted by Jess from A Shop La Mercerie. So that is all coming. Coming out, I've got two more sweaters and two accessories yet to come out this year. So I am kind of winding, putting all the finishing touches up on those. Um, I can't believe how fast this year has gone. Does anyone else feel a little tired? <laughs> I'm like, where did this whole year go? I just feel like it really went by fast. So anyways, let's slow it down a little. I think it's that winter, that winter feeling. Winter is coming and I'm ready for like snuggly, slow mornings with some spinning and knitting and weaving and sewing. I have too many hobbies. Baking. Okay, I'm just rambling now, so I'm gonna end this here. But thank you all so much for joining me. And I hope that you have a lovely weekend. I think we are gonna have a pretty gorgeous fall weekend here. I hope you get to do some fun fiber related things. And thank you so much for joining me. I hope to see you back next week. Bye.